July the 27th, 1953. Here at Panmunjom, Korea, United Nations and communist delegates meet to sign the armistice agreement, which will put an end to three long years of fighting. In the tense atmosphere of this bare building, unsmiling communists sign the formal paper. The terms are clear. Effective 2200 hours, the United Nations Command and the People's Army of North Korea will cease fire and prepare to withdraw all troops and equipment two kilometers from the military demarcation line. But the war will wear on for 12 more hours. Men will fight. Some will die. The Army, the Marines, Air Force, Navy will carry out routine operations until the last round is fired. The last bomb drops. The last broadside fired and the last carrier-based plane returns from the final strike. 2200, cease fire. An unnatural silence crosses the front, over shell-marked hills, pitted shores, and the cold, dark sea. The guns are quiet. Armistice. For pilots and crewmen and sailors aboard carriers, it's been a long, grueling war. As the uneasy truce goes into effect, these men can look back over the months and find on each page of the calendar the record of their carrier's accomplishments in the Korean War. Many remember the first carrier strike of the war. How within 48 hours of receiving combat orders, the fast Valley Forge steams from the Philippines to a launching point off Korea. Here on July 3rd, the Valley and the British carrier HMS Triumph send the first strikes against the communist capital of Pyongyang. North Korea. More carriers follow. In these hectic days of the Korean conflict, Navy and Marine squadrons concentrate on Red Armies surging south across the peninsula. They make the transition from World War II quickly. Their mission is clear. First, air support for Army and Marine troops defending a shrinking perimeter. Strikes to within 50 yards of friendly forces. Here, peacetime training pays off. Ranging far behind enemy lines, carrier planes find plenty of targets. Troops, trucks, trains, tanks, ships, planes. All moving against United Nations forces holding the Nakhtong River line. Communist harbors, factories, refineries and mines. The sources of enemy war material. By September, it's time for the Allied end run at Incheon. Now, carriers move to positions off the enemy-held coastline. Planes soften up invasion beaches for the assault forces, provide protective cover to infantry units breaking out of their beachheads. More landings carry the war home to the communists. Chinampo, Wonsan, Iwan. Carrier-based aircraft sweep in to provide close air support to ground forces slugging their way north through Korea. United Nations troops advanced rapidly towards Manchuria, but communist armies are now receiving strategic war material from friends in the north. To reach the front, these urgently needed supplies must cross a river, the Yalu. In November, the Yalu bridges become priority targets for carriers operating off Korea. Navy planes use time-tested dive bombing techniques to hit these pinpointed targets spanning 200 miles of frontier, and it hurts the communists. For the first time since early in the war, their air force appears. The Reds go after Navy bombers, but they must reckon with Navy F-9F Panther jets first. In early November, jets from the Philippine Sea tangle with MiGs over the Yalu. In high altitude battles, these planes make the first Navy jet kills of the war and the bombers sweep down to wreak more destruction. But now China enters the war. Waves of troops surge down from the north and stop the United Nations advance in the snow-covered mountains and valleys. The 8th Army needs air support, desperately. Vice Admiral C. Turner Joy, Commander Naval Forces Far East, throws every available aircraft carrier into the fight. Flying from positions only a few miles from the actual battlefront, Navy and Marine carrier planes encounter the full fury of Korean winter. But it takes more than snow to stop the carrier sailor, the carrier pilot, 
throughout the final days of 1950. Naval aircraft keep up their relentless pressure until the last United Nations soldier is evacuated from North Korea. But early in 1951, the Eighth Army stops the Communist offensive. General Matthew Ridgway, now commanding the forces ashore, orders Operation Killer, destruction of enemy troops and equipment wherever found. At the front, along the North Korean coastline, and far behind the front. Aviation plays an important role in Operation Killer. To Navy, Marine, and Air Force squadrons goes the important job of wrecking enemy lines of communications by attacks on rail yards, bridges, transportation facilities, and equipment. Orders go out to the 5th Air Force and Task Force 77. Prevent the flow of troops and supplies to the front. Interdict, strangle. Aircraft carriers are especially suited to the coordinated air interdiction program. With United Nations Naval Forces in command of the sea, these mobile air bases can operate far to the rear of the enemy. From the exposed communist plank in the Sea of Japan, carrier aircraft are able to strike strategic targets in Northeast Korea, targets far out of range of shore-based fighters. Over the next two years, Operation Strangle becomes a primary objective of carrier operations. The plan is ingenious. Cut the bridges, cut tracks, close tunnels, hit rail marshalling yards, force the enemy out on the highways, shoot up his road traffic, force him to move at night, then lash out with night fighters, make life miserable for the communists, interdict, strangle, night and day. For carrier men, interdiction is an around-the-clock proposition, day in, day out, month in, month out. Flight quarters, fuel planes, arm planes, spot planes, launch planes, fast fleet fighters, harbingers of the jet age, panther, banshee, fighter bombers, piston veterans of World War II, the Corsair, back at the familiar job, and hard-hitting dive bombers, AD Sky Raiders, carrying deadly loads into the West. There's no rest for the carrier sailor even those who wait. As the months of war drag by, carrier-based planes flying from ships in the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea play an important role in the United Nations drive back north. They fly close air support missions in coordination with Air Force and Army units. But their big job is still interdiction, bridge busting, rail breaking, tunnel blasting. These become routine. The means of accomplishing interdiction are varied, some unusual. As in April 1951, when the communists launched their ill-fated spring offensive, United Nations troops dig in behind the Pagan River, waiting for the attack. But the Reds have a plan. They close the gates of the Huachan Reservoir, hoping in this way to lower the river's level so they can press their attack across the Pagan against the Allied defenders. But the communists don't figure on the Princeton and her dive-bombing Sky Raiders. For the first time since World War II, torpedoes are combat-loaded on the big bombers. These planes fly far inland to the Wachon Reservoir, swooping down at treetop level to launch their torpedoes. All direct hits, reservoir floodgates open with great geysers of concrete and water. The Pocan River floods. The communists wait. Advantage lost. A year later, a spectacular interdiction operation. This time, carrier planes team up with shore-based Marines and the 5th Air Force. The target, communist power plants near the Yalu River. On two days in June 1952, carrier planes mount a total of 556 bombing sorties. While Sabre jets fly high cover on the lookout for MiGs, naval planes sweep in to deliver their deadly loads. 90% of North Korea's entire power potential is knocked out. For Navy and Air Force, these are the largest raids since World War II. Carrier aviation has other jobs to perform in support of the United Nations effort, spotting for naval gunfire, working closely with the fleet. Airborne eyes train seaborne artillery on coastal targets. Photographic reconnaissance is still another carrier job. Carrying photo planes fly low over heavily defended positions to bring back information for tomorrow's strike. Other planes, other ships, keep the carrier fighting. Cargo carriers 
like this converted TBM torpedo bomber, bring in mail, spare parts, passengers on regularly scheduled runs. Cod Airlines, sailors call these lumbering planes. Supplies must also come from the sea. Ammunition from ships in the Mobile Logistic Support Force. Oil and gasoline from fleet tankers. Dry and refrigerated stores from attack cargo ships. Floating supermarkets. Everything from soup to nuts. The task force is built around the carrier. Screening destroyers receive fuel, news, and spiritual comfort from the floating city it protects. Buffeted by angry waves, racing ahead, behind, on all sides of the carrier, the destroyer is an ever-present, tireless sentinel, and though the carrier sailor might take its presence for granted, he would feel mighty uncomfortable if he knew the cans were not close at hand. This is the carrier, its men, its planes, and its record in the Korean War, a record that speaks of itself. From late 1950 through 1953, the United States Navy maintained continuously on station in the Far East a hard-hitting carrier force, independent of Korean land bases, sustained by the Mobile Logistic Support Force at sea, free to move at will to points far behind enemy lines. This force reaped the dividends which come from command of the sea. Here is what naval aviation accomplished in Korea. Over 1,119 days of sustained combat operations, Navy and Marine squadrons launched a total of 183,000 aircraft. These planes, from piston corsairs to sleek sky night, flew more than one-third of all the combat sorties flown by the United States during the Korean War. On strikes against the enemy, carrier-based aircraft delivered more tons of high explosives than carrier planes dropped in all of World War II. Today, these veteran carriers and the men who fight them stand ready to help United States naval air power strike against any future aggression anywhere in the world. <laughs>